what's the best way for somebody to reduce calories? I got to tell you, for a client like you just mentioned, a very busy professional individual, uh, meal prepping. And we've had plenty of research to show that uh, one of the most beneficial, uh, measurable lifestyle changes you can make would be meal prepping. And that's whether you utilize a meal prep company, and I'm not shilling, I, I own the vertical diet meal prep, I ship meals nationwide, but whether you make your own meals or you get them from a local meal prep provider or utilize one of the you know, meal prep providers, uh, that is a, an extremely successful uh, behavior. The bodybuilding figure physique bikini industry has been doing this for decades. They carry around their Tupperwares and they put them in their six pack bag and they, everywhere they go, they're eating out of their little Tupperwares. And it seems somewhat laughable to, to the general population, but that's the reason why they're so successful. They eat exactly what they're supposed to eat every day on a clock. Uh, the exact number of total calories and the macros that they prefer. We can get into macros, but uh, that's how you control calories. If you get hungry and go open the refrigerator, uh, you're probably going to lose that battle. You're going to grab a food that you're hungry for and you're going to overconsume it. If you get hungry and go to lunch at a fast food place or at a restaurant, uh, you're generally going to order more calories than, than you should be consuming to maintain a calorie deficit. Um, those are, those are very difficult, uh, paths to, to take. You're just, you're going to fail on that. Restaurants underestimate their caloric, uh, their, their calorie count by up to 40, 50%. And, and we're terrible at, at, uh, at estimating portion sizes. We're off by 50%, generally speaking particularly when you get a lot of quote unquote hidden calories, uh, oils and stuff that foods are cooked in, uh, just a tablespoon of butter or a tablespoon of olive oil or a tablespoon of, uh, you know, something that's cooked in that's 150 calories right there. You get a couple of those and you've blown your deficit for the day. So those are, you know, I think meal prepping is the number one thing for that type of individual that you just described. Uh, and then after that, you know, we talked earlier about eating more whole foods and, uh, eating higher protein diet. Uh, and higher satiety foods and getting more sleep. Uh, but the meal prepping, I mean, that's, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. If you make all your food for the day and you just eat the food that you're supposed to eat for the day, uh, you're going to be more successful than if you just try and wing it. And, you know, you're absolutely right. Some people don't like to count calories. Uh, some people even object to the idea that it is a calorie equation at all. They, that they, they are offended by the idea of Kiko, calories in, calories out. And it's because they don't appreciate that the equation is actually total daily energy intake and total daily energy expenditure. And it accounts for things like the difference between a carrot and a cookie in terms of calories uh, due to fiber. It accounts for things like, you know, exercise activity uh, and thermic effect of food, higher protein diets, uh, netting out fewer total calories. So the equation accounts for all of those things, but people will often, uh, they'll, they'll migrate to one of the diets that, that uh, promises them they don't have to count calories. Uh, let's talk about the three types of diets real quickly. There's only three types of diets. There's only three ways to reach a calorie deficit. Uh, Dr. Peter Atia refers to this as CR, TR, and DR. Calorie restriction, that's what you and I have been discussing. You weigh and measure your food. You use an app. Uh, you learn how many calories are in your food. You use the label on the back of the box or whatever, and you, you track exactly how many calories you consume. That's calorie restriction. Uh, another option is time restriction. Maybe you eat a 16-8 or a, you know, a 24. You just eat within a particular time window and you don't eat outside of that window. That's a form of caloric restriction. It's just that you measure it in terms of time rather than counting calories. Uh, the other one's going to be dietary restriction, and that's where you start eliminating food groups. That's your keto folks. I'm not going to eat any carbs. I'm going to res dietary restrict. Uh, paleo people, I'm not going to eat anything that a caveman didn't catch, right? Um, that's dietary restriction. So you have, and you can couple them together. You can do keto intermittent fasting. I'm going to cut out carbs, and I'm only going to eat between noon and four. Uh, so those are all strategies that you can implement. None of them have been proven to be any more successful than the other. There's nothing magic about them. Uh, over you know, thousands and thousands of studies on millions of people for many years now, we've discovered that, uh, that uh, dietary adherence 
uh, is the most important factor. And you just have to pick the diet, as Lane always says, that feels the least restrictive to you. And so I have keto clients. I have carnivore clients. I have vegan clients. I have clients that intermittent fast. And it's because they choose to do that because they find it's easier for them to comply with the diet. I have more clients that count calories because that's my preference. I don't like restricting time because I feel that potentially it compromises lean body mass. I don't like restricting carbs because I feel like it uh, compromises performance and it's not necessarily that sustainable long term. People always feel is eventually like Dr. Peter Atia after three years of pissing on keto sticks uh, and, you know, talking about the, all the benefits of keto uh, now eats carbs again because it's discovered that it's important for anaerobic performance for weightlifting. And it's, uh, it's also uh, more sustainable in terms of how his family eats. So he doesn't have to feel so restrictive. So that's, that's the nuts and bolts of, of, of the options that are available. And I encourage people to pick the one they feel works the best for them. And, but I, my specific recommendations are, are, you know, a more evenly balanced diet that you track and then uh, because it has a performance benefit that a lot of people that I work with, I want them to be able to have a good training session. And so I think that one of the other roadblocks that people bump into, so let's just say the person that we're, let's just say that the, you know, the people we're trying to reach now have already accepted the fact, okay, if I want to lose body fat and I want to maintain muscle, I have to do these things that we've already talked about. But then they hit this roadblock where they're maybe three days into it, four days into it. And they're like, wait a second. I don't look any better. I don't feel any better. I'm not losing any weight. Do you think the person then is not eating enough? Are they eating too much? Like, how do they determine like where to go from there? Yeah. Well, for a while there, some people were claiming that you could uh, ruin your metabolism by not eating enough. And in fact, that's not the case. Generally what we find. And I, I hate this conversation because it's blaming the victim. Generally, what we find is people aren't accurately measuring their intake. Uh, sips, licks, bites, snacks, uh, drinks. Um, generally speaking, what they presume to think is a 1500 calorie diet uh, averages out to about 2200 for the week when they include uh, you know, a, a binge, uh, you know, one evening or they go to dinner with the wife or uh, they just aren't accurately counting every thing that they're consuming that that's 90 plus percent of the time i just find that there's a, a problem with uh accountability on on tracking calories uh and that always seems like i'm blaming the individual but it's just it's factual that there's there's no uh, metabolic damage that just hasn't been proven and so uh, generally what happens if people plateau sometimes especially if they're beginners and they have a significant amount of body fat and they're just starting to lift weights, they're recompositioning and they're gaining some muscle and losing some fat. And the scale isn't going to tell you any, anything you want to hear on that. Uh, but a tape measure may and uh, a progress picture may. And if you, have a, a, if you start with progress pictures and you start with tape measurements of your waist in particular, the scale might not move at all for a week or two, but you might lose an inch on your waist. And that means you're gaining muscle and losing fat. There's also uh, the fact that weight loss isn't linear. And there will be times at which uh, your, your body, you do not lose weight. Even though you did everything the same that you did the prior week where you did lose two pounds, then you lost zero. Uh, a few things can happen. You should weigh in daily and average the total for the week and compare it to previous weeks. Uh, looking at the daily fluctuations can be discouraging, particularly for women, because maybe you had a big leg day the day before. And so you have a little bit of inflammation, a little bit of water retention, a little bit of, uh, maybe you ate a meal that was higher in fiber and it's holding a little water. Maybe you just had a higher carbohydrate meal and the glycogen's holding a little water in the muscle. Those are all things that could affect uh, women in the menstrual period that could affect weight from day to day. Um, but if you hang in there, the research also shows that if you hang in there, even when you have a plateau, be patient, be persistent, um, eliminate the potential uh, errors uh, by counting calories accurately and uh, making sure your step count is, is sustained, uh, you'll find that the weight loss will begin again. And at some point, you may reach a plateau simply because you've lost enough weight such that your metabolism has slowed a little bit. And that's expected. That's normal. You're not going to burn as many calories 
you know, when you're 150 pounds as you did when you were 200 pounds, uh, that's, that's a, you're expected to have a reduction in your total daily metabolic rate, in which case you might have to reduce uh, some more calories in order to continue to, to pursue your goals. So the main um, like rocks people should focus on from a nutrition standpoint um, and what we're talking about is protein, fiber, foods that are highly satiable. Um, you know, sleep's obviously not a food thing, but food, but sleep impacts satiety and hunger and stuff like that. Um, focusing on whole foods, drinking enough water, and then also finding the the flavor of caloric restriction that works best for the individual. And then from a weightlifting and exercise perspective, it's resistance training anywhere between two to five, six times a week or whatever is most maintainable for the individual and making sure you're training, training hard enough that you are training to, to near failure and producing um, and, uh, and really like working your muscles to near fatigue. And then also getting in daily steps. Like the steps should be an everyday thing, right? Oh, absolutely. Ten minute walks. A hundred percent. And so let's just say now that for the sake of argument that this person is now progressing, they're losing weight, they're dropping body fat. And now they're at a place where they're like, ah, I feel great. I'm doing well. Um, I'm, I'm following Stan's advice. I've gotten to where I want to be. Now I want to maintain this. Now I want to focus more on overall wellness and longevity and maintaining what I have. What are some of the shifts that have to happen um, from a, again, like a long-term point of view for the same person to be able to maintain what they've worked so hard to achieve? Yeah. Well, the nice thing is, is if you retain as much lean body mass as possible while dieting, uh, you'll be able to add back in calories. You'll have less of a decline in your total metabolic rate. And you get to put back in the three to 500 calories that you had taken out in order to lose weight. So you, that's a, a nice place uh, to get to. And then you get to eat a little more food. Uh, and so that makes the diet a little more sustainable. But in terms of long-term health, uh, you know, sleep's going to be the, the, the major one. That's the biggest priority. It's the, the foundation upon which everything else sits. And so if you've gotten good sleep habits, uh, quantity and quality, uh, for those people with apnea, getting a CPAP, uh, being careful about interruptions during the night, you know, cool room, quiet room, dark room, make sure that there aren't pets or kids disturbing your sleep in the middle of the night. So sleep's the big one. Uh, the next is going to be increasing your cardiovascular fitness and your strength. Those are two very big predictors of uh, not just lifespan, but health span, the more important, I think, metric that people should be paying attention to. Um the cardiovascular fitness can be achieved simply from, uh, you know, just increasing your pace, getting your heart rate up a little bit, uh, and consistently doing that on a daily basis. Uh, and then incorporating some hit training would be nice twice a week, get on one of those, uh, assault bikes and, and just go all out for 15 seconds and do about, you know, a few rounds of those that would give you uh, a really good cardiovascular stimulus. And just continue to get stronger. It's a really important component long term is that your your strength is a good predictor of uh, of your health span. They use proxy measurements like grip strength, etc. But it, it, all it is is to measure uh, really the the accumulation of hard work that you've put in, uh, either whether it's resistance training or cardio. And it's important to recognize that the vast majority of your benefits, uh, your health and life extension benefits are realized from going from zero to, you know, something sufficient rather than uh, thinking that you have to become a Olympic athlete or something to have, uh, you know, those benefits actually, as you get, as your cardiovascular fitness improves, you get less and less, it becomes what we call uh, uh, asymptotic, right? The, the slope, uh, your, your return on investment uh, is not as significant. And so I don't in encourage people to, to do any more than, than what they're inclined to be able to sustain over the long term, uh, because that, that could be kind of discouraging. Like we talked about, you start a program you can't adhere to, and next thing you know, you just abandon the whole thing and feel like you're a failure. 
I'd rather have something that's, that's part of a lifestyle that you enjoy doing, that you can do consistently. And if you accumulate enough uh, cardiovascular work and, and, uh, and strength training, you'll have a uh, much less likelihood of suffering from any of the, uh, the chronic illnesses that we seem to be experiencing because we're 70% overweight and obese and um, uh, sedentary.